Welcome to chapter 26 of the American Pageant. It's an AP U.S. history book or regular U.S. history or college dual enrollment. We're looking at the Great West and the Agricultural Revolution uh, from 1865 to 1896. We're going to break this into four parts. Uh, our first part is Clash of Cultures to the end of the trail. We're going to look predominantly at the Native American clashes with the encroaching settlers and predominantly white settlers coming to the West. We have a painting here of a frontiersman looking west with his young family, and they're going to go tame this wild land is what they're going to do. So you have this clash of cultures on the plains. Uh, Native Americans were pushed onto the plains from whites <coughs> and clashed with the tribes that are already there. And so many tribes that were in the Midwest, in the Southeast, they're pushed out on the plains, and there's already Natives living there. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of turmoil going on. Um, you have the, Comanche, the Comanches, uh, the Cheyenne, the Sioux, or the Lakota, uh, who displace other tribes and modified their cultures to be nomadic uh, hunters. They adopted the horses, um, they, which were brought in by the Spanish centuries before. Uh, they adopted hunting and became very aggressive Native Americans. All these new tribes put a strain on the buffalo supply. The buffalo were the essential animal to to live they were life on the great plains and so everything was about the buffalo more people living out there meant that more people are eating more and more killing more and so there's not as much to go around for everyone uh plains indians depend, depended on everything from the buffalo uh they burned the dung for fuel they used the you know the, the fur to stay warm the, the the bones were used to make uh tools uh, even some of their internal organs were used to store water or carry water. When soldiers showed up, the whites spread cholera, typhoid, smallpox, which ravaged the populations of the Native Americans. So they were dealing with disease and dealing with problems in that regard. Uh, they also reduced the buffalo population, the bison population, through hunting. And so some railroad companies hired professional hunters like Buffalo Bill, uh, William Cody, uh, the men depended on meat, the, the, the uh, U.S. Army, and so they killed buffalo as well. Um, and you also have reduced grasslands from grazing, um, using the precious cottonwoods near the rivers. Um, the horse was life to them. That was their, their mode of transportation. That's how they survived. Uh, and during the winter, when everything's covered in snow, the horses, uh, they, they suffice on eating cottonwoods. Well, when the whites showed up, what little wood there is in the, in the plains... Uh, they chopped it down and burned it or used it for building supplies. Uh, and so now it's more of a strain, an ecological strain on the resources to survive in this inhospitable climate. Um, this is showing the introduction of the horse, how it spread out of Spanish-controlled uh, Mexico into the north, uh, into all the way to California, all the way to Canada, uh, and up through all the western United States. These are the uh, the great tribes in the united states this is where they were uh pre-whites and then all those ones in the east they're moved these ones are moved to the west and they're encroached and oftentimes they give up their land and they went to indian territory or the dakotas uh, and so these tribes all had to compete with each other uh, and then you have the large ute here we'll talk about that later uh, so the class of cultures keeps going. The federal government tried to appease the Plains natives, so the Indians, by signing treaties with the chiefs, and it's in quotes on purpose, uh, and various tribes at Fort Laramie, at Fort Atkinson in 1851, 1853. Uh, these treaties marked the beginning of the reservation system in the West. So basically, they would give up their rights to the property and go live on a reservation, and the government would give them food and give them supplies. So in the North, all those Plains Indians were moved into the Dakotas, uh, in the south, uh, you know, Great Plains, they were moved into Oklahoma or the Indian Territory. Indians usually recognize no authority outside their own family. Tribes and chiefs, this idea that there's a big chief that controls all of the Sioux or all of the Cheyenne was unheard of to them. And so they were fictitious names made up by white people. And so they didn't understand the political structure or the family structure of the Native Americans. Um... Natives didn't understand the uh, the boundaries of white boundaries of, of land or the concept of land ownership. To many native tribes, owning land was like saying you own the air or the water in the stream that's constantly flowing by. Um, I know there's water right issues and things like that. We won't get into that. Uh, in the 1860s, the government had grouped uh, plain Indians into smaller and smaller plots of land, trying to turn them into you know little farmers like like white people. Uh, Indian agents were often corrupt. 
skimming off the top, not giving the best stuff out to the natives, just doing really, really bad things. Uh, and so because of this, many Native Americans were desperate, <coughs> and they waged war on the encroaching whites. The whites were killing their culture. They were killing their people uh, through diseases and moving them off the land and killing the buffalo. And so many young braves went and fought the whites. Uh, One-fifth of the army, I shouldn't say just the whites, were the, quote, buffalo soldiers, which you probably know from the very famous Bob Marley song. Those were African-American troops. They were named that because the Native Americans thought that the African-Americans' hair uh, resembled buffalo fur. So they were called the Buffalo Soldiers. And just put that on sometime. It's a great song. It's fun. Uh, this is a painting. Uh, this is the Buffalo Hunt by Frederick Remington. It was done in 1890. Looks like a unsuccessful when you have, a, unfortunately, a horse and a Native American that didn't make it, uh, it looks like. Uh, these are Pawnee Native Americans in 1868, uh, showing off their lodge um, near the water there. Uh, and that way of life was foreign to whites. They, you know, To whites, they saw them as uncivilized. To use their words, they were savages, uh, which is an incredibly poor way to, you know, to describe people. Uh, and so some of this conflict here, Chief Red Cloud, um, pictured here. This is Chief Red Cloud. Uh, in Minnesota, killed hundreds. He did a lot of raids in Minnesota in 1862. Uh, the army was sent out. They fought the Lakota and pushed them out into the Dakotas. Uh, he was trying to stop the settlement of Minnesota from the whites, and it didn't work. In 1864, you have the unfortunate Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, uh, where the Cheyenne, under the leadership of Chief Black Kettle, were slaughtered and murdered by Colonel John Chivington, uh, pictured here. Uh, it was a reaction to the attacks on the white settlements by the dog soldiers, the Braves. And so uh, a militia was ordered by the Colorado governor. And so they sent out John Chivington. Uh, he attacked and killed estimates from between 70 to 163 people. Um, the natives waved the American flag. They were waving a white flag. Um, the Native Americans sadly were mowed down. Chivington, even though there was predominantly women and children and older men, attacked the village in what is now deemed a massacre. Uh, Congress actually investigated this all the way back in the 1860s, which was pretty unheard of back then, to see if Chivington did anything wrong or if, the, if they did um, follow the you know, procedure. Uh, they sat on the sides of whites, but the fact that there was an investigation was a big deal. Uh, Captain Silas Sout refused to obey orders. He actually testified against Chivington in Congress. Uh, after this and so this ultimately forces the Cheyenne to stop fighting in 1865 and they are forced onto the reservations in Oklahoma uh, so what you have is this kind of general going back the natives are attacked and then they attack they retaliate and so you have Fetterman massacre where the Sioux the Cheyenne and the Arapaho killed 80 soldiers in 1866 this was led by Crazy Horse supposedly this is a picture of Crazy Horse Many Native Americans and historians reject this notion that that's Crazy, for, uh, crazy Horse because he uh, didn't let any himself ever be photographed, and so it's disputed if that's an authentic picture or not. Um, the little, little Battle of Little Bighorn, so uh, Custer, Colonel Custer there, and some people incorrectly label him General Custer, uh, announced that there was gold discovered in the Black Hills. They were supposed to be off lights to off off limit to whites. The Black Hills were sacred. They were religious holy land of the Native Americans. Whites routinely in treaty after treaty said, "We will not touch that land." Custer announces there's gold there, and keeping white people out of a gold rush is like keeping a heavy set person like myself out of a buffet of free tacos. It's not happening. Um, and so the gold rush was caused by his announcements. And so Native Americans refused to sell the hills. They were sacred. They were promised this land. And it leads to clash. Uh, so Chief Sitting Bull, pictured here with his, his uh, nice lone feather here, gathered the troops in Montana in the, the Little Bighorn River. Uh, the 7th Cavalry, led by Custer, wanted glory. He wanted to eventually run for president someday with his golden locks. He's, let's be honest, he's wearing a, he's got a mullet. He's, that dude's rocking a mullet. Uh, if he was driving an IROC, like an 87 IROC Z Camaro and sipping a Budweiser and listening to Leonard Skinner, that guy right there, you wouldn't blink an eye. He would look just like someone that did that. But anyway, he wanted glory, so he disobeyed orders and tried to attack the native settlement. Uh, he and his men were completely ambushed in June 25th, 1867. Uh, 250 soldiers, American soldiers were killed. They were scalped, including Custer himself. Um, this shocked the East that this was a huge defeat, that this large of a force 
uh, could be attacked and, and disintegrated, dec decimated by the native population. The victory was short-lived. The army crushed the uprising after this and forced the Lakota and the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Comanche and all those tribes eventually onto the reservations. Chief Sitting Bull fled to Canada. The Canadians were a little different with the Native Americans. They welcomed them with open arms. They provided food. But it's just really cold in Canada. Sorry, Canada. Uh, the Cheyenne and the Sioux were put on reservations in 1881. Um, this is a, a painting. Uh, it's the Battle of Little Bighorn done by Amos Bad Heart Bull. It's from a Native American perspective. This is supposed This is supposed to be Chief Sitting Bull here with his war paint all over his body. Uh, there are bodies strewn all over uh, of the U.S. cavalrymen slaughtered by the natives. Here are some of the um, places we've been talking about. We talked about the Sand Creek Massacre here in southeastern Colorado, the Battle of Little Bull Bighorn. We have the whole uh, Apache Wars down here in Arizona, the Red River War with the Comanche, um, Fort Wrigley, Ridgely, excuse me, this is where uh, Red Cloud was attacking, uh, the Battle of Bear Paw Mountain is where the Nez, Nez Pierce and Chief Joseph surrendered, where he famously said that I will fight no more forever. He was 40 miles from freedom, 40 miles from the Canadian border, when he was surrounded by the, uh, the U.S. Army. Uh, the Apache Wars in Arizona, Chief Geronimo, one of the most legendary chiefs in American history of the Native Americans, led raids against the settlers in 1880s uh, in Arizona. And every time the, the U.S. Cavalry thought they captured him, he simply vanished. They couldn't capture him. He just it was like a ghost. Uh, he always seemed to vanish. He gave up. He finally surrendered in 1886 after all the Apache women were th sent to Florida. And so they separated the men from the women. Geronimo, not wanting his people to suffer, uh, turned himself in. And so the great warrior of the Geronimo and the Apache were eventually defeated as well. Uh, the Nez Pierce, as I stated earlier, fled in their own, from the army in 1877. They were a peaceful tribe, one of the tribes that helped out Lewis and Clark on their journey way back in the early 1800s. Uh, but some braves attacked whites, and so the army was sent in. And Chief Joseph, sadly, was moved on to the reservation with his people. Um, they were 40 miles from the Canadian border. And so you have the changing culture. A part of the reservation system, they were allowed to go out a couple times a year or annually uh, to hunt buffalo, but there's just simply no bison left. They can't survive anymore. They can't live their nomadic way. Uh, and so they're forced into poverty because the buffalo is almost, they almost go extinct. Uh, from hunting, I mean, they, I mean, trains would have people, passengers, just shoot buffalo as they were driving across, riding across the plains as sport. Uh, and this was dependent. The natives depended on everything, and whites are just shooting and killing the buffalo for no reason, just for fun. Uh, the whites eventually wanted to assimilate the natives, make them into little white people. Uh, diseases and alcoholism ravaged their populations. Uh, and the railroads meant that there was always going to be a constant supply of goods for the whites. There's also going to be a constant supply for soldiers. They see there's no hope to fighting. Um, after the Civil War, talking about the, the, you know, the bellowing herds of the bison, there was 15 million bison grazed on the Western Plains. There was a train delay, I believe, for eight hours at one point. Because there was a buffalo herd so massive uh, that was in front of a train. They had to wait for this whole herd to cross. Uh, I was right. I jumped ahead. Uh, the Kansas Pacific was delayed eight hours while a herd was in its way in 1868. Uh, each new group of settlers that comes out to the West hurts the natives, whether it's uh, the ranchers or the, the, the homesteaders or the prospectors or the army or the railroad men. They put a strain on that ecological, those very precious resources that made survival on the Great Plains uh, able to, to, to happen. I mean, it used to be called the Great American Desert, actually. So the threats to the buffalo, you had hunters who killed them to feed the railroad workers. Uh, picture on the here is Chief Sitting Bull with Buffalo Bill Cody. He in one hunt supposedly killed 4,000 buffalo to feed the railroad workers. Uh, some killed them for hide, some killed for sport. Um, the whites believed that they were doing this because they had a mission from God. They had manifest destiny. Uh, they believed that they were civilizing the native savages and bringing Christianity to them and trying to make them good people. Uh, by 1885, there's fewer than a thousand by bison or buffalo left. Uh, they've been slaughtered for their tongues, their hides, for amusement, and they are on the brink of extinction and almost wiped out. So this is the end of the trail. 
By the 1880s, the nation began to realize the horrors it committed against the Native Americans or the Indians. Uh, Helen Hunt Jackson published A Century of Dishonor in 1881 that told the record of government ruthlessness and dealing with the Indians, the broken treaties, the lies, uh, the unfulfilled promises. The Dawes Severity Act of 1887 dissolved the tribe as a legal entity. Uh, it wiped out tribal ownership of land. It set up Indian family heads uh, with 160 free, or 160 free acres, which basically took half of the land that they already promised. Uh, and basically outlawed their languages, their religion. They tried to end Native American culture. Um, if the natives would behave like good white settlers, they would gain a full title to their holding as well as citizenship. Full citizenship to the United States did not come to, United, uh, to Native Americans until 1924. The Dawes Act is severe. Uh, it attempts to assimilate the Native Americans. It remains the basis of the official Indian policy until the Indian Reorganization Act during the Great Depression of 1934. Um, in 1879, you have the government founded or funded the Carlisle Indian Institute or School in Pennsylvania. It was a school to break Native Americans of their culture and to assimilate them into white culture. The quote or the motto back then was, kill the Indians, save the man. Kill their culture, save them, uh, help them come to God. They would make them cut their hair, put on trousers and, and you know shirts, and pick out a good Christian name. So instead of being Sitting Bull... You'd be Bob. Um, there was one here in Colorado. Fort Lewis College started as an Indian school that was uh, bragged about how quickly they could, you know, change a native into a white person, which we know today is just so terrible and awful and uh, disrespectful to their cultures. So the last piece of the pie, the last piece of the puzzle, was the Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, Wavoka, who was a Cayute, a Paiute, excuse me, uh, had a vision of the ghost dance, uh, and basically that if by performing this. Uh, Native Americans would revive their past greatness. So the buffalo would return, the white man would vanish, and so it spreads like wildfire. Every tribe in the West on a reservation starts doing it. And it's a very energetic, very uh, loud, very um, scary dance, especially to outsiders. And so the government naturally banned it. Uh, the Lakota kept dancing, and so the army was there. Um, they didn't like that, and so they tried to get Chief Sitting Bull, who was back on the reservation after traveling along with Buffalo Bill, to try to get the Lakota to stop this. Uh, and in them trying to grab him, there was a shot fired, and he's accidentally killed uh, by a Native American police officer. Uh, and so and did the Lakota retreat to Wounded Knee Creek. Uh, there they perform the ghost dance. The, the whites show up, the army. And they basically used the Gatling guns and rifles and fire into the crowd. On December 29th, 1890, um, 150 Sioux were killed at Wounded Knee Creek. Uh, they used to call this the last battle of the Native American Wars. It's the last massacre. Uh, and this ends the armed conflict and Native Americans fall into destitution, poverty, and really just, you know, people forget that they're even around. It's very, a very sad, tragic story in American history. One that we need to study, that we need to look into and remember that people were treated unfairly, that there are people that are, uh, you know, down on their luck and having a tough time. And it's because of the history of this country. Uh, and we need to learn from our mistakes and not cover it up. So if you have any questions or comments, put them in the, uh, in the comments here. This is a picture of Native American uh, reservations near the turn of the century. Um, this is a picture of, uh, what do we have here? Oh, this is the Comanche village. Excuse me. This is Lakota's receiving their rations in 1881. This is what it. This is them getting handouts from the government. This is what it looked like in 1834 before the whites. This is a Comanche village painting by George Gatlin. Um, and then this is just showing the 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 Indian removal of and throughout the United States in 1790. Here, there's everything in green was Native American land. Fast forward to 1860, 1880, 1890. And into 2000, basically 2% of the land in this country is controlled by Native Americans now when that whole map used to be all of theirs. So very sad chapter in American history. Like I said, if you have any questions, let me know. Hope you enjoyed this or learned something.